I'm sure you've heard your yep. Call to order the City Council work session for City of East Grand Forks for Tuesday, July 12th. It's now 5 o'clock. City Clerk, please call roll. Mayor Here. Council President Mark Here. Council Vice President Tim Here. Council President Here. 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 Present. Here. Does determine quorum number one discussion on projects for federal sub target funds, Mr. Murphy, Mr. Stordahl. I guess I'll get started with this and maybe turn it over to Jason at this point. So, um, I guess the reason this is before the council uh, for discussion is um, are the two preferred projects that we've had are the two preferred projects that have been identified um, the 10th Street Northeast and the Bigland Ryan. Reinhardt roundabout um, we're starting to have some concerns that they potentially will not um, be ready in time for the 2023 deadline to utilize utilize that fund those funds so um, it would be prudent if we wanted to identify some projects um, as a backup to maybe um, to use in case those don't come to fruition um, so yeah We've had some discussions with the mayor, and the mayor has indicated that it wouldn't be a bad idea if to have a um, some of those projects uh, identified to be discussed tonight. So, with that, there is a list of, I believe, six yes, six potential projects. Um, these projects on here, um, they wouldn't each by themselves might not utilize the entire amount of the funds, so it could be more of a mix and match as well. So, because what we're looking for tonight is some feedback from the council on. Uh, maybe ranking some of these projects. I believe we have the, we invited the MPO here as well to update us on what some of the processes would be for uh, changing these or to amend the the plan for that. And I guess with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Stordahl or um, Ms. Person, Alford. can you do me a favor and go over the timelines, why oh. these timelines won't be met oh. and what they will be? Yeah. Well, I guess I'll start with the 10th Street Northeast one. Um, from the, the last conversations that we've had with that is uh, that the, our long range, our transportation plans, I, I always get these acronyms wrong, is it STIP and TIP, need, need to be amended to include those projects because those have to be in those plans in order to be eligible for um, federal sub-target funding. Um, the last indications that we've had with that is that the time process with the that would be plus with the studies that would be required that that might not be done in time for meeting the, the deadline for uh, submittal for the, the 2023 funds. Uh, the Big Lynn Reinhardt roundabout, um, to be quite frank, it's it's been a fairly controversial um, project and we've had a few meetings on it. And um, as it sits right now, it was vetoed and that veto has not been overridden. So it's still not uh, a project that um, is on the that is on the line for construction. Uh, it would take some council action in order to get to get it put in back into the pipeline for that. So, on the industrial uh, 10th Street, the study one's anticipation of the timeline and when that's going to be done and back to us. Do you know? I do not know. Do you, you remember know that? Stephanie that? I don't remember which study it's part of, but what's yeah. the deadline for the study that the uh, industrial parks? Um, it's currently part of the street and highway plan um, as, as a focus area. And while the plan would be completed in 2023, um, the, the actual study is that focus part is still being worked on right now and we're, we've just gotten started on the whole plan itself so okay. i guess maybe uh, council president if you were maybe asking i know that there was some talk about the city potentially funding a, uh, the study or doing a, a a study to move that process along um, however the initial costs that we had gotten back from that were pretty cost prohibitive for us doing that individual study so those have not been undertaken I guess now that I think about that might have been the question you were asking. No, um, okay. I understood that one why we weren't doing it, but I'm just trying to make sure everybody understands what the timelines are. Okay. Are we talking end of 23 so we would have, wouldn't have have a chance to approve this for the 24 construction okay. season? 
that's yeah. what I'm trying to make sure everybody understands that and that people are listening and understands that what why we are okay. to be able to move forward um, so thank you if I could real quick on the roundabout also um, that is going to take some time also in the area of property acquisition and I would suggest that we keep moving forward with these high priority projects but I don't think it's only because of the mayor's veto and not acting to bring it back I think we're going to be really really tight for time on the roundabout also just looking and listening to the uh, what happened the other night as for um, some of the preference of uh, individuals along in there it'll just take a little time to sort that out but I do recommend that we do that again keep it going in a, in a cooperative way with the adjacent properties to clear the way for that to happen do you want to start Jason to take over now or? yes yeah so Jason if you have anything to add otherwise yeah. we can start discussing the uh, the, the items I don't have a whole lot to add. Is this fun? Um, other than pretty much what's in the RCA here, the mayor asked uh, Steve and I to identify some some uh, streets or project areas that would be eligible for the federal funds. We took a look at all of them, drove all of them, and came up with these six that are before you tonight. Um, we talked with uh, Stephanie Terry at the MPO and ask them just to make sure that they would qualify and they would be able to meet the deadline, um, these projects. Uh, so we identified the, fo the following that you see in the list there and figured that depending on which projects are picked, we could possibly do more than one, probably even two or three of the six that are listed on here. So. Um, that's what we'd be asking tonight if the council had any any ideas on different projects that they'd like to select if they would like to select other projects and I guess we can answer questions on any of the six between Steve and I and um, Stephanie and Terry can talk about more of the process if as far as if we move forward on these projects what the process is moving forward then for amending amendments and stuff like that so mr. Emery yeah and our, and our thought was again we've kind of identified you know six possibilities there you know if the council would like to you know choose three four of those options you know maybe your preferred options you know then we could uh, start to develop some cost estimates for those and see what we could you know get completed um, for the money that we have available um, just you know, so you recall again, we're going to get 860,000 in federal funds. Um, it's an 80-20 split. So you know, we're looking at about 1.1 million in construction dollars to be able to get the full 860,000. So you know, that's what we would be trying to, you know, I think maximize that. I think we're, we want to get every federal dollar we can. So. So again, that's, you know, based on our review of all the streets that would be eligible for this funding, this is kind of a list we came up with. Um, you know, it's really, you know, probably more of a maintenance project more than anything, you know, more than complete reconstruction, everything like that. Um, you know, I think like David and the mayor, or David and Jason had put in the RCA, you know, just, you know, trying to find something at this point that, you know, hopefully is not controversial. You know, we can move ahead. We can meet all the necessary de deadlines. Um, it's my understanding, if I'm not incorrect on it, but, you know, the funds need to be, basically, we'd have to have the project bid and awarded by June 30th of 2023 would be the absolute deadline. So about a year from now. But, you know, and Stephanie and them can talk about that too, but it is going to require potentially amending the Metropolitan Transportation Plan, um, getting these whatever projects we may choose, we'd have to get them on the STIP. Um, so there's a process there that we'd have to go through, you know, with the MPO. 
And then, uh, you know, once we get through that, you know, we would have to complete uh, project memorandum, do the, all the environmental stuff that goes along with that. So, you know, it, there's a process. Yeah. Stephanie had some strong thoughts on the roundabout the other day when we met in my office. And I wonder if you'd be willing to share those just really to complete this conversation sure. so it's clear what is the future of that? Sure. Um, well, I guess starting with the roundabout, um, I definitely think it's needed, and even more so looking into the future, um, depending on, I, I mean, it's, there's so many factors of just how quickly the city grows, and if you have a bridge in or not a future bridge, um, a roundabout will be key, that you'll need something at that intersection. Um, I, I'm concerned that um, you don't have what you need in place to make that happen. Um, so if you do go after that project, I, I mean, it, there's probably a good chance you probably will lose the funding because you won't be able to meet the timeline of what you're sitting in right now. Um, but I definitely think it's a, a needed thing in the future. Thank you. I know at one time <clears throat> we were when we met uh, Jason, Steve, and the mayor, and David. We talked about maybe David wasn't there yet. Um, some of these items that were on here, the one through six, that maybe at one time it had been talked about at MPO and, and discussed. And so my question is, I'm assuming since. Jason and Steve met with you, Stephanie and Terry, that these one through six, is there any roadblocks in any of them that we would have an issue about getting amended? Oh, and it, I know it's not, you can't answer that because you don't, everybody's got to vote on it. I get that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, is there something in here that you would say, well, I don't know if that's even possible? Um, I wouldn't say roadblocks, but there's definitely hoops you would have to go through. Um, we reviewed the list and it, it looks like you should be fine moving them forward. It'll, it, it'll just be come down to um, the amendments through the plans and if both cities are on board because you will have to amend um, the transportation plan and then you'll have to reach out to the Grand Fork city side and get a letter from them saying either that, um, I, I guess it depends on um, from their side um, after reviewing the, their side of things and since you share a plan with them if um, they'll have to go through their process of amending it or they might say just administratively that it's fine and here's a letter saying we're good go forth um, and do what you need to do on your side but if they need to amend their plan on their side that's a two-month process so it really kind of depends on a few things but I would not say roadblock just some different hoops depending how things kind of lay out I, and I can go through that if you want more detail of what that timeline is or if you need a more of a detailed, because it, it took some brainstorming. <coughs> it was kind of a head scratcher at first of like um, what the process would be. And so. Yeah, I just don't want us to say, okay, we're gonna do one, three, and four and just not even, <clears throat> and all of a sudden we get down the road and, right. and we're like, well, no, we can't do four now because the, then we've got to go back and yeah. start and the timeline's down two months already. And The only thing is you want to be pretty proactive and quick. You don't want to drag your feet. That's the only thing that you're probably the roadblock you're going to hit is um, you're going to have to go through these amendments and then right now we're in the middle of changing the tip and step. Um, so there's kind of a hold on that. And when the hold is over, then we'll have to go and add these projects or whatever project you add to that. And that will be a process. But the longer you kind of drag your feet of moving forward with whatever project, more that timeline of things that you need to go through to make this happen is going to push out. And then it's probably going to, that will be your roadblock is time. Okay. Mr. Larson? Yeah, just a question for the MPO staff. Um, yep. Is there, I'm, or could you clarify, is the process to amend the transportation plan for the, the 10th Street Industrial Park project different than the process to amend the transportation plan for items one through six? Or yes. wh why is that different? I can take that yeah. over um, I, because it was at, during my time. Um, at the executive board, um, 
when we were going through the original amendment process, which in which 10th was part of, the executive board had questions, and those questions were going to be answered in our focused area study and our current transportation plan update. Um, and, and we left it, they left it at, once we have these answers, then we can amend our plan. So once and until those answers are given to the board, we can't go forward or the city has to come to the board and ask and, and provide reasonings that will persuade them to change their minds. I understand your question, Brian. Um, I think the process to amend the MT or Metropolitan Transportation Plan is the process itself is similar to what we went through with the 10th Street project. It's once it got to the executive board that it failed basically. Mm -hmm. But if we have to amend the transportation plan again, the process is going to be similar for these projects as it was 10th, correct? Correct. And there, is that the question you were kind of asking? Yeah, I'm just trying to understand what's the difference. Yeah, you know, the biggest difference is is that when we're starting to look at our transportation current transportation plan, a version of these or the very fact that they are more maintenance projects automatically will allow them to be just moved into the current plan of time frame mostly, and then we can move it forward in our tips. Tip and step. Okay, so it's just the nature of these maintenance projects. We think that they'll sail through the the next round. And of they approvals. were um, quite a few of them were already mentioned as full reconstruction or a larger level of rehabilitation projects anyway in our in our tra current transportation plan. So that it was just they were put off to a later time as mm -hmm. opposed to this time frame. So this would be a near term, mid term time frame for doing these projects. We're looking at fiscal constraint. We look at um, how how much money we, we kind of estimate work with DOTs to estimate how much funding we predict into the future um, covering this time frame. And then we and then we ask and work with the staff as well uh, what projects are going to be needed in those time frames. So in a midterm, short term, midterm, and long term time frame. So. Which making an amendment is a little bit easier. Um, yes. When you reach out to the Grand Forks side, they'll most likely see it as administrative. They won't have to go through their process since it's already mentioned in the plan. Okay. I got to say that for guarantee, but it probably. Sure. <coughs> and that's not what happened to the 10th Street project. That Correct. got that the, got snagged, pulled back, asked for more information, yeah. and now we're caught in this the, cycle. Yes. The with the 10th Street, um, you know, I'm not going to doubt that this that city staff hasn't looked at it at, and needing anything before, but it has never made it onto um, any of our project lists when we do our our plans. So since that didn't happen. We didn't have any other connections that we were looking at for bike, ped, transit, you know, and the freight usages of that area. So it's, I mean, we looked at freight usage a little bit, but, you know, it's most, some of that area is also gravel, so we can't really get a, a good pavement management reading on that as well. So, you know, those were the things that were. But it's mostly because it was never at any point in time in our in any of our project listings, even illustrative or, you know, anything of that nature, so that we can swap out projects mm -hmm. easier when they're already listed. So basically, it came down to the executive board not approving to pass it on. So the voting members on that board said no. We need more information. So it gets down to that, Mr. Mayor. Um, do I understand also that? The time spent studying will also look at the whole area of our industrial park to say even is this our highest priority need of, of a street in our industrial park. Correct. Right. So that's good. And including transit and yeah. uh, bikes and pads in that area. 
I think that's it's going to turn out to be a good move to really make sure we're again spending our dollars as wisely as we can. Mr. Elms. So, <clears throat> is what I'm hearing is that we as a city council can't really do any of these projects without the blessing of the MPO? Is that kind of what I'm hearing, or am I? We're, we're teammates. We're working together. Yeah, I like that answer better. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we are teammates. We we work through our planning process with, you know, all members of the city staff as well as the public, bringing forward projects and to get priority listings and what how people envision the city working as well as bringing it to a regional level. Uh, once it's in our plans, then everything is pretty well. You, you've already put gave, given your input into the process, and we are having plans and put forward in our current plan of bringing forward a lot of this information straight to the city councils, both this East Grand Forks and Grand Forks City Council. So you guys get updates as we go through this process. But yeah, we're, we're at, we ask for a lot of uh, input from the public as well as we get a lot of input from city staff members as well. So we need to be very careful from now on on how we yeah. plan our strategy in this MPO and how we're going to do things. So yeah. we. The biggest thing is that the state, uh, the Minnesota DOT also looks to those plans uh, for reassurances that these are are not fly-by-night projects or anything like that. They, that they've been looked at and they've been uh, looked at in a uh, thorough manner, in a complete manner. Mr. Murphy? Uh, I guess one thing I'd like to add to um, the answer for Mr. Elm's question, I, I think an important distinction to be made is that um, if we're gonna be doing these projects on our own with local funding, I think that'd be one thing we wouldn't need the MPO's, I guess, a blessing on that part. But That's I guess correct. I think the important distinction to make is if we're going to be using the federal sub-target funding, yes. then yes, we have to go through the MPO and get their approval. But if we're going to be doing these projects on our own with just local funding, we'd be able to do that and yep. the MPO wouldn't have anything to say about that it. That is correct. Grand Forks does that quite often. Yeah. Ask Mr. Grasser. <laughs> 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 Anybody else have any questions? Do we have any <clears throat> one through six? I'll say so. Mr. Demers. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, well, I think it's a, a better than good process to go through and identify lots of projects in our city um, and have have a um, a roster, if you will, of projects that we can go to for these type of projects we know that not only is our federal sub sub target dollars but there's a lot of other dollars that are available that we should be at least looking at and i guess trying to access um i would add to this list um you know the r roundabout at uh river road and 17th um is i believe in our transportation plan <coughs> um that's something that should be kind of marked out as a project that we could go after. Um, that's an intersection that is kind of a mess. Um, we, I would say we should also look at, for federal sub-target dollars, um, the uh, urbanized section of Reinhardt from, what is it, 14th? 13th. 13th to the city limit. Um, should be a pretty simple project to do. It's basically, most of the storm should already be there. All the underground stuff should already be there. I would couple that with a tap project that would extend sidewalk completely down Reinhardt. I would do both sides, but I, I mean, like Bigland, we did one side, then the other. So I would, I would try to couple that with that type of a project. Um, but, like I said, there's a few other projects that we could probably think about, but I think those are two that jump off the page to me that we know that are in our plans already that we've kind of identified. I think I had Nancy look up. I think she said that the the urbanized section is in our, it's an illustrative plan or whatever in our 
<clears throat> past plans. So, I mean, it's kind of already in there. It's all, it, we've already got a lot of that information. Probably, um, probably the biggest challenge we would have on that one, Mark, is once we hit basically where Brandon Boulevard is there, um, city limits starts about in the middle of Reinhardt Drive there. So we, the city would have to own that property. It would have to be annexed into the city before we could do that project. Well, we own to the back of the properties on Greenway, right? We own, Which is right across yeah. the road from... We own to the back of the properties <clears throat> on Greenway Boulevard. Yeah. And then as it comes basically, let's say, west here, it comes to about the center of Reinhardt Drive and then goes south to city limits. So the problem... Well, I guess maybe not city limits, to the... I would say to maybe one panel south of Brandon, I guess is, I was unsure where the city limit was. So we'd still, West even side. if you're going to go past Brandon, you're still going to have some property acquisition there that you have to take care of before you could ever do that project. Because you have to go, the city has to own all the property. Oh, that's in city limits. Or it's in city limits, yeah. We could it. could become a timing issue potentially if, if we're looking at annexation and everything else. I, don't know. I we guess. We can annex right away. What's that? We can just annex right away. Right. I guess I'm just putting it out there as a yep. possible project that could get done pretty quickly, I believe. Yep. I mean, I don't think there'd be a huge pushback from Reinhardt Township or, right? Is that Reinhardt? Yep. Yeah, that was right. Huh? Would yeah. you say that your greatest concern with that urbanized section is the safe pedestrian element, or do you well, have the drainage? Thing, or? Right. Like, so I, if you think about the TAP project to try to do sidewalks on Reinhardt, <coughs> really, in order to do that, you kind of have to tie it into a safe routes to school project, which is on the south side of Greenway Boulevard, which you can't really do that because it's... I mean, it's a ditch, and if you ever drive over there, there's tons of kids that are running up and down those ditches and out into the <clears> street and stuff like that. So the other side of that, too, is there's drainage issues over there constantly that you could kind of clear up by making it, dropping the street down, making it an urbanized section. And I just think it 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 becomes a more inviting corridor for future de development going south. Oh. I met a mom in a stroller there the other day, and it's tight for yeah. pedestrians. It's real so tight. if you come off of Greenway, if someone lives right over Greenway or comes, you see it all the time, people coming from Brandon Boulevard, and they'll, kids especially, they'll cut across that rural section, and it just, it gets pretty dicey. It's a, it's a narrow road. So I guess I would add that to it. Now, that being said, I guess it, I want to, my main point is that I, I feel that it, it is, a giant failure if we don't go ahead with the roundabout project um, I would say that <laughs> the fallback to non-controversial is is it's frustrating um, the fallback to non-controversial controversial means that we are unable to grow to change to do anything because all of those things take um, they take effort, but they also take change, which causes some people uh, discomfort. It causes some people uh, advantage or whatever. But if we can't do things that require uh, people to uh, change, then we are going to be stuck in this in this spot for a while, and it's unfortunate. And to say that this is just about you know residents and businesses and stuff, you know, we have there is a cost to not doing this for especially one of the businesses there one of the things that we've been told is that one of their big concerns is certainty what will happen at that intersection um, you know it's not just the the long-term growth that that you're talking about and ability to handle traffic going forward it's really businesses trying to make decisions about how they grow how they how they um, invest in our city and for us to keep this going forward um, dragging it along um, I think is detrimental to that business and and 
frankly, it's a detriment to the people that use that business. <laughs> I, I think um, we have a huge opportunity to do that. So um, I, I do. I think this is, if we don't do a roundabout there with this in the cycle, I would consider it a major failure. Thank you. Mr. Bitter. Thank you, Mr. President. Last night at our joint meeting, we talked a lot about being proactive rather than reactive. And when we get a bridge in the next few years, Reinhardt is going to become a major corridor. And anything that we can do to alleviate that traffic congestion and build safety now before the bridge comes in, we'd be very proactive in doing that. So without a roundabout, we're just looking for future problems when that bridge comes in. We need to do the roundabout now. We need to do the urbanization on Reinhardt. Um, so anything that we can do on there is what I'm looking at. Piecemealing this together, I've said before, I'd rather not spend any of the money rather than just, well, let's do this project, this project, this project. That's the kind of stuff that the citizens hate. They hate to just, well, you're just spending it just to spend it. And no one likes that. Um, the roundabout is the most feasible project. There's no reason it shouldn't be done. We've had four plus years to get that thing designed and developed and land purchased if we need land purchased. And we haven't done any of it in four years. So now to come back and say, we've got nine months to do this, that's just unacceptable. So we've had the time to get this all planned and ready to go. Should have been ready to go last year. So for where am I where I'm sitting, the roundabout is where this money needs to spend. Mr. Jones. Thank you. Uh, I again am on the other side of that and I think that what we need to do first, uh, and it was brought up last night. Uh, because you're still talking like you're going to put that bridge on 32nd. I think we still need to get that resolved first where that thing's going to go before we go and spend all this money for different things that you're talking about. It's going to help things. Uh, we've already purchased land out there thinking that's going to go on 32nd. We don't know. I think we need to have that answer before we move on on that project. That's my opinion. Uh, I don't think that, and uh, you know, the residents out there voiced their opinion at that meeting how they felt about it. Uh, I think we need to listen a little bit. <clears throat> yeah. I do think there is a way, you know, if we follow some, some good guidelines and, and everybody pool their own good judgment, we can deliver value to our people by doing our, our high priority maintenance type projects. You know, panels along fifth that are completely obliterated they're broken into powder and, and we haven't been able to find the dollars to fix those panels kind of um, you know where it is by its Williams Park and then farther to the north there's a section and um, I really think especially in a time like this a lot of folks with inflation are kind of tightening up their belts and and uh, finding a way to you know just kind of get through this weird little stretch we're in economically and so if we deliver what I would consider high high value with some good maintenance, I feel like the, the, the citizens would look at that favorably and say, you know what, makes sense, you're taking care of our money. And I really do, it's federal sub-target dollars, it's the people's money. It's like we took it right out of their pocket and we're gonna spend it to their priorities, that's what we wanna be doing. Mr. Vetter. Uh, thank you, in answer to Mr. Helms, the, the land that we purchased doesn't specify a 32nd Avenue bridge corridor. The land that we purchased actually serves any of those corridors, whether it be 32nd, Elks, or 17th. It would fit right in there with any of those corridors. So we haven't purchased the land just to make it as a 32nd Avenue corridor. Uh, second, the roundabout, yes, when the bridge goes in and the additional traffic is there, the roundabout would be a, a, a boon to that traffic and help that traffic flow. But there's a need right now also for that roundabout. Uh, yeah, we heard some select few there, and usually when you have a meeting like that, those are the ones that you're going to get are the ones that are vocally against anything. But I can tell you, I continually get calls and people that I run into in my ward and in your ward that live on Reinhardt and on that south end that <coughs> are pushing for a roundabout. 
they are frustrated with the traffic on those roads and they want a roundabout. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor. Say one more time, roundabout at, at Biglin and Reinhardt, will it work well? I have no worries about how it'll work. I have no worries about being able to maintain it and move snow off of that. We have pretty good snow plow operators. Um, trucks will get through, buses will get through. So please, if I have any reluctance to, to go charging ahead with the roundabout, it's not about how it will function there or how it will ease the traffic flow. It'll work <coughs> just great. So when it happens, and it will, if it's <coughs> now or five years or whenever, um, please know I'm on the side that says a roundabout at that location is going to work just fine. Um, and let's make sure in this juncture that we that we spend these dollars to our highest priorities. That's that's my only concern with it. I don't want to leave any doubt about that. I don't worry about a roundabout and how it'll function there. So I guess the question is, is that from Jason and Mr. Emery and Mr. Murphy on what you're anticipating or wanting from the council timelines of making a decision and telling Mr. Emery to start working on numbers. Uh, I mean, you're asking us tonight to say, well, this is what we want you to do, or do you want us time to look at these more? You know, I know you said it out last week, but is this something that we need to take some more time looking at it? And I'd like to, like a, like to have a drop dead date that we have to say, okay, this is what we have to do. Yeah, well, I guess it depends on which projects would be which drop dead date you would you would have on that for the roundabout in particular um you know we have the we have the appraisal we have what what the estimated cost will be for some of the land for the land acquisition um with the appraisal we would still have to negotiate that um you know and if not you know then we'd have to use the the eminent domain based on on that appraisal, um, there is still the question about if if there would be any further property um, needed up in that that corner um, that could uh, amend the timeline some. Um, so I, I guess it really depends on on which which one it is. So yeah, I'm not opposed. You guys certainly can take um, until the next work session and look this over, come back, mull it over, and give us some direction on that. I would say if we if we are going to proceed with the roundabout sooner rather than later uh, is probably as soon as possible to get moving on that because we will have to get some property acquisition uh, we so we already got the got it started with the appraisals uh, however we would also have to start discussions with the with the business owners there as well for the configuration for the ingress and egress um, and aligning that so um, so I, I guess I don't have a drop dead date for you on either one here. There's probably more time with some of the the options that are listed here tonight. If if we are going to put the roundabout in sooner rather than later, sorry, that's about the best answer I can give you. Thanks for being vague, um, <laughs> Mr. Gulstead. Hey, I, I, oh, I apologize for being late. I was on in court still. What's the drop dead date that we have to have this money spent by? Because if we're saying that's within this nine month time period, from a legal standpoint, I don't think it's feasible to get the roundabout completed and put in and the money spent in the nine month time period if we have to acquire <coughs> land, negotiate, and do quick takes or eminent domain, deal with the, the business owners. Um, I think you're really pushing your luck. I think you can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe that we have to have the contract let by, was it the end of June next year? We'd have to have it let and awarded by June 30th. Of so we wouldn't have to have it spent, but we'd have to have the contract in place be correct. before the end. Of Mr. Mayor. Is there anything that would keep us from taking one through six and kindly requesting that our friends at the MPO uh, go through their steps of including those in a plan? All of them. <laughs> that was a big sigh, Steve. Again, oh, correct me if I'm wrong, Stephanie. I mean, one yeah. through six are, are in the plan. It may require some amendment to the plan. But, yes. you know, the biggest thing we need from the council is 
direction at this point. I mean, are we going to keep moving with the roundabout or are we going to kind of switch gears and do more of these maintenance projects? You know, Honestly, and, I, and I hate to put Jason on the spot, but you know, I mean, Jason and I, again, we spent some time going around and looking at these streets and there's a definite need for some maintenance on these streets. And, and again, right now we have a funding source to complete these maintenance projects. If we don't use these funds, you know, I don't know where Jason's going to find the funds to do some of these maintenance projects, you know, so any the other projects. Um it's not as simple as just one or two panels. Like if you just take number one on there on 5th, from 15th to 20th, it's one of those where, where do you start and where do you stop? You know, it's it wouldn't maybe need to be a full reconstruct like we were saying, but it's nothing you're gonna touch with our maintenance dollars um, to be able to do what we need to do. Um, so, yeah, that is the question. You know, how are you gonna fix some of these ones on this list? if you don't do it with a project like this. Mr. Ellis. Thank you. I go back to the same thing again, uh, as far as out there on Bigelin and Reinhardt, tearing up two per perfectly good roads. If you haven't been on Fifth Avenue Northeast up there, if we let that thing go very much longer, it's gonna look just like our roads in our industrial park does. And that's not gonna be good. And, that, and the beat trucks and everybody use that thing, you know, you know pretty heavily. And there, there's panels up there right now that are, uh, you gotta slow down or you're gonna hit your head on the roof of your car when you go through it. If you don't, it's, it's really bad. How fast are you going through there, Dale? <laughs> 45, 50, no. <laughs> no, seriously though, you don't have, and, and when you're driving a pickup, you don't have to be going very fast to do that. So, uh, but but fifth is, is I guess, I'm, I'm happy to see that as number one on the list because we talked about that street for how many years too, and and haven't done anything. And if it goes another, if you even let it go another couple more years, there's just not going to be anything left of it. It's going to have to be a reconstruct then. So if we can fix it now a lot cheaper, that's what we should do. And I believe Mr. Murphy had even received a phone call from a property owner up there, kind of requesting some repairs be completed on that road. That is correct. So that would be special assessed. Part of that road would be special assessed if we chose this that would be a city decision if you want to assess a portion of that yes were you not planning to do this as a as a repair without special assessments was that not well i guess you know typically i guess you know maybe i go back a little bit i mean i think if we were looking at complete reconstruction you know maybe we would look more at uh, assessments you know more if it's more of a maintenance project you know maybe there we wouldn't do assessments. Mr. Larson. Yeah, um, just kind of my thoughts on the subject at hand here. You know, I think it's pretty obvious all of the stress and frustration and hard challenges here. This is a side effect of deviating from the plan, right? You know, if we were going to, we're choosing not, or we're not moving forward with the roundabout, it's vetoed. I don't believe we have the votes to override the veto. It's my personal thought. Uh, and this is what you suffer with when we deviate from the MPO's plan. It, it's painful, and I think it's meant to be painful. Um, that being said, I'm not in favor of walking away from these federal dollars in any form or fashion. Um, I do think it's in our best interest to put this into a large project to get the most bang for our buck, uh, but there isn't one at hand here, or there's nothing that, that's within grasp we can move forward with, I believe. Uh, so it kind of leads us to this like least attractive decision, but it's still a good common sense meat and potatoes project. I, if all of these concrete panel replacements were all put together, we bid this thing in October, got a really good price, um, stretched our dollars as far as we could go, maybe with some alternates. I, I think you would have a pretty successful project. It doesn't move forward our transportation planning in any form or fashion, doesn't help us with our industrial park. None of the goals are the things we talk about in our strategic planning decisions, but it's all better than not using these federal dollars. So that's, that's kind of where I draw the line is not going to let a penny go away from East Grand Forks. So if we can't do the big projects, if we can't stick to the plan, this is this seems like something to move forward with. That's my thoughts. Mr. Demers. Where is our state maintenance dollars? Where? 
that they may use on fifth if it's a disaster. The state aid dollars actually have been in a five-year plan that um, Steve has put together, and a lot of it's gone to safe route to schools. So we've been paying a lot of that. And ADA, we've been spending probably about a hundred thousand every year on ADA projects. So nothing's cheap, and so there's probably four hundred thousand in there after the year after we pay for all those projects that has to come out of there. For example, the roundabout, we just we got a bill for one hundred eighteen thousand dollars. I don't know where that money's going to come from, unless we take it out of state aid dollars. So projects where we don't have money to fund the whole thing, the money has to come from somewhere. And that's where it's been coming from. Well, if we have 400,000, you said after we do that? I, I'm not sure, because I don't know what all the estimates are, what projects are. We have to not, you know, when you look, can't just include construction dollars. We also have to know what the engineering costs are and all that. Um, Yes, we state aid maintenance, yes. No, it's federal dollars that we can't use for soft costs, correct? Right. That's my understanding. Because we have been using right. using state aid maintenance for for projects and you know, you can't divvy up the projects and only paying for construction or only paying for engineering with state aid dollars. So no, we have been using those dollars to cover what is not covered by <coughs> Other dollars. Well, I guess my point is, is if we have three, four hundred thousand dollars, which if you're saying you can do a bunch of these projects for a million, I mean, you should be able to knock off a chunk of those every couple of years here and, and do the maintenance that we we should be doing. Um, uh, in that four hundred thousand dollars, though, there are already projects that we have set aside that money to use. So next year, when we're doing the quiet zone, there's money that we have to cover on that. So. I don't know of any other fund that money's going to come from except that fund. So I, I can't tell you a dollar amount now unless you went through every project to see where we're at. But I mean, I agree, yes. I mean, if there's money available, we could do those for the projects. But most of the money out of that stated fund for, for matching dollars are called for. Yeah, and like I said, the state of repair is important, obviously. But your point about, you know, you know, if we can't get this done, then yeah, we go back to the maintenance thing because it's easy, because it's simple to pop what's a panel. I mean, it's the plans are pretty easy to pop, put panel replacement in. Um, and I think the frustration, at least I don't know what's speak to others, but the frustration on my part is this is the pattern. We've done this for eight years. We did this four years ago. <coughs> where we said, this is what we're, our project is. This is We said it four years before the project was going to happen. We said we've got to acquire the property, we've got to do all these things, and then it's four years later, we can't do it. So we're going to shift gears, we're going to do maintenance projects with all this stuff, all over town. We're going to do ADA ramps and sidewalks and curb cuts and do all these things. We said, okay, we're going to do that. Then we're going to do the round book, because that's what we decided years ago and then we move forward and get to deadline again can't do it we got to do all these things move the deadline back another year still can't do it we can't we got to do all these things so let's just do maintenance again because it's easy. that's the frustration I think. well because it's easy and because it's necessary right but we also have funds for some of that stuff not enough well, Jason gets 250000 every year. He's always wanted to up that even at three hundred or three fifty because it's not enough to do what he needs to do just for the little places here and there. And I know you can speak to that, Jason, but, I mean, I see it every year, you know, and he'll call and say, okay, you know, how much, you know, we need to do this, this, and that, or whatever. Or Nancy needs a little section of um, sidewalk that needs to be completed to tie with what Jason's is doing. So, you know, it's, it's a scramble to find money. To get everything done. Right, but I I feel like some of that too is because, and I spoke to it earlier, is because we don't have a list of, we don't have a roster of projects. We don't have that sitting there. So then it becomes a feeding frenzy of, well, we need this money. Let's go get it. We don't have a, we don't have a project, a street, 
I'm not trying to destroy well, anybody either. But we don't have a, a list of here's the money that we're bringing in. This is what we got to do. <coughs> Let's prioritize it and do that. You know, so it ends up being first come first for it. So hey, we have this project. We'll pull this out. We have a five-year plan that we, you know, utilize for what we're going to use our state aid maintenance funds on, and or our federal funds. So, are these so we do have a list. Plan? Huh? Are these projects in that? Plan? They're not part of our. Um, these projects aren't part of our state aid maintenance funds at this time. No. In and what was, years. and what was listed on the federal sub target was either tenth or the roundabout. I mean, that's what's kind of on the five-year plan right now. I'd, you know, we can even get ahead of that, Mr. Demers. We can, <clears throat> let's let's really dream and come up with these plans, and then go after the funds, right? A lot of communities are doing that. If it's if it's the roundabout, if it's tenth, if it's whatever we're doing in the industrial park, bring in Mr. Gordy and some economic development funds. You know, if you get organized and you and you lay out the plan and, and the the listing as you've described it, now you can go after the funds and, and find them because they're out there. Uh, so I, I support your idea of getting ahead of this and then going after the funds to actually fund our priorities for future development. Does anybody else have anything? Yeah, just kidding. <laughs> well, Keep them all shut. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, if I could also, to this point, one last thing. Um, have we opened up friendly conversations with the individual selling two lots by the senior center? Have we had a, any kind of conversation with the, the seller of those? Uh, I have. Uh, it was initial. It was an initial conversation. Um, we received the. The appraisal. I contacted him. Said that we did have an appraisal. He said that he was willing to discuss selling that property. Um, however, you know he uh, would want to meet and talk about the terms and those types of that type of thing. Uh, we did have that meeting. Um, the and since then the project, not, nothing has changed. So I have not had any further conversations with him since then. Is he a, um, a willing seller? He's willing to talk. We have we haven't come with with a with a price yet or not because we haven't. I mm -hmm. haven't given him the appraisal, nor have I discussed the price with him, due to the fact that we that would be something that we would meet internally and put mm -hmm. together a strategy with the council let's, as a whole before we let's move. Let's do that. Let's do the internal meeting. Let's kind of just keep going step by step on all this stuff. Yeah. So so he is. The, the last time I spoke to him, he he is willing to talk, but yeah, you know, we we'd have to talk terms and numbers. We have to do a closed door. Yeah, yeah that would be closed. Let's do it. Thank you. All right, number two, review potential easement for traffic signal pole and electrical cabinet. Mr. Emery. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so MnDOT is in the, the planning stages um, for a traffic signal replacement project on Demers Avenue at Demers and 2nd and Demers and 4th. Um, with that being said, over the years, the traffic signal that's in the southwest corner of Demers and Fort there, um, it's been hit numerous times with truck traffic trying to make that right turn movement from Demers onto <coughs> Fourth Street there. So, you know, we've been kind of working with, with MnDOT to, um, to try to, you know, resolve that issue when, when they do the traffic uh, replacement project to 2024 so so at this time you know we we do have some <clears throat> some options um, you know we can push the pole further south along um, 4th Street there or MnDOT <clears throat> MnDOT has asked about the potential to acquire a permanent easement um, from the city you know within the VFW parking lot area there and if they were able to acquire that, then they would put the pole within that easement area, and then they would also locate um, the traffic signal cabinet in that same location. So, so with that, um, you know, we said we talked to them. We said that we would bring it 
um, forward, see if the council is interested in giving, I shouldn't say giving, in um, giving or selling uh, an easement to MnDOT. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Mr. Demers. <laughs> so is the pedestrian crossing going to remain in that quadrant? The, the what? The pedestrian crossing. Yes. People still be able to cross the river zone. Correct. So is MnDOT then compliant? They, they're going to allow trucks to run over people in that intersection <laughs> or on that street, but not the pole? Is that their... Oh, kind of like crooks. <clears throat> no, no, no. I, I, I guess my point is, is if there's a problem with trucks turning, if there's a person standing there and they're going to run the person over, <clears throat> I, I would hope that there, there's a light pole there to at least deter them a little bit. Um, What's the difference between a light pole and a signal pole? What's that? What's the difference between having two different poles there? You said light pole. Or, sorry, signal, signal pole. Sorry, I meant light pole. Okay, I was saying. Uh, traffic light pole, I guess. Right. I, I mean, it has the hydrant that's there been hit too, or what? I mean, I don't think we've had ever had the hydrant yet. No. I mean, I disagree with giving the, or even selling the, the easement to the to state for a number of other reasons, just because it precludes us from doing anything on that property in the future. Um, but if they have a problem with it, I would think that they could either relocate it, or I would suggest you know maybe we need to put cameras on there and start getting the people that are. <laughs> You know, turning illegally and fix the problem, not adjust to allow people to <laughs> to, to make bad turns. I guess I don't know. <clears throat> I know there's the the big truck, you know, advocates that say it can, it's hard to make turns, but yeah. I don't know. It seems like lots of trucks make that turn all the time. So I guess my point. Long story short, I would give them an inch of that easement. So if we move them to the south, we'll repeat everything. Yeah, so I'll start from the top. So, don't. so yeah, I mean, if you don't, if you don't grant them an easement, um, you know, they would probably still push the pole further south just to alleviate the problem. And then what they're actually looking at doing is they're looking at acquiring some property um, to the north side of Demers Avenue, there where the coffee shop is. They would probably work with them to get an easement from them for the traffic signal cabinet. Mm -hmm. So all we, all we told them as they asked, all we said is we, all we can do is bring it forward to you guys and, and see if you're interested in, uh, you know, granting them, selling them some easement. And if not, then they will just go another direction. They want to buy the whole lot. <laughs> I doubt that. It's another <laughs> option. It would be nice to see a plan, kind of what they want to do there. Again, I would ask if I know MnDOT's plans need to re Include all phases of transportation. I don't know how this adequately addresses pedestrian traffic at that corner. Um, you know, kids go over there, going to the pool, going to whatever. I, I think if they can't address that, and their solution is we just we're going to turn a blind eye to it. I, I question their plan. In a lot of urban areas, they're actually trying to bring nodes out. To make it safer for pedestrians to cross, not pushing nodes back where they got to cross a wider section. Yeah, and they're not pushing the curb. No, back. no, no, I mean, no. Right but now, it does open <coughs> the door right. for. Right. It's basically creating a turn lane right there. Right. Mr. Larson. Yeah, thank you. Um, some of this was mentioned by Councilman Demers. But, uh, you know, that location I would like to see developed at some point. And I think that that's in the city's best interest when the right deal is at hand. And that's sometime in the future. To give up right away or any property here could tie our hands or um, make the parcel less attractive to future development. So I think we should be extremely cautious with any of this property and make sure that we do what's in the city's best interest long term. So I'd be very concerned. Thank you. That's why my question is if they move it south, you answered my next question already, they would have to move that box across the street so yeah. it wouldn't be on our property. So Correct. that'd be my preference, preference sir, because so. 
I, I mean, Nobody I got, else. I know your wishes, and I will just forward that on to MnDOT. A similar thing with I know like that the cameras that they end up putting on stuff are mostly traffic count can cameras and are inex inaccessible for legal um, challenges. I believe, right? I mean, you can't you can't go and look at those <coughs> to find violations. But are there? Is there space to be leased, or is there a possibility of putting some sort of camera up for, you know, notif identifying violators of that? Like from, like if the city were to purchase space or allow access onto there. I mean, I know you can use other cameras, you know, in the vicinity. Could you? Could the city actually? If we know that there's an issue, <coughs> could we put a camera up there and just, if there is an incident, we would have. You know, at least some evidence. And asking at this point. I'm just wondering if MinDOT would allow us to put a camera up there if we think that there's violations that are happening. Up to the table. I can hear you, but I don't know if you Good question. I don't know. Will the state allow you to utilize their polls though? I don't know, but I think you could put it on your own light pole if that's what you wanted to yeah. do. You know. Anybody else? Everything on that. Thank you, sir. Move on to number three, consider our master partnership contract with the Minnesota Department of Transportation, Mr. Stordahl. Thank you, Mr. President. So it's time to renew our master partnership agreement with MnDOT. Um, this is a co contract that we operate under. Um, so when we exchange services, for example, our we have a work order that's set up under our current master partnership agreement, or was, um, in which MnDOT pays the city for our services on business highway two for snow removal and maintenance. Uh, the contract that's proposed now is almost word for word what our last one was. Everything has worked well. I see no reason in changing anything. I had Mr. Gall said review it as well, and I think he was of the same opinion that it was almost word for word. Everything <coughs> works well the way it's set up now, so I'm just asking to move forward with the signing for another five years. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Stordahl? See you on, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Move on number four, consider a 2023 MnDOT transit application for a fixed route in Dalaride. Ms. Ellis. Uh, thank you, Council President. Um, I'll just be honest with you, this application is literally just a crapshoot right now. Um, I received no information, cost allocation plan, or budget from Cities Area Transit, um, and I was required to submit it by July 1st. So what I did was um, took last year's application, which we were told we could take last year's application and uh, add up to 10% uh, due to inflation. Um, I know we're going to uh, increase uh, our drivers' uh, wages by 4%, and then the remaining 6% could easily be eaten up with the cost for materials, equipment, uh, fuel, uh, other <coughs> types of things. Typically what we do is we have a cost allocation plan where we figure out last year's um, uh, cost based on mileage as well as based on um, other types of uh, uh, concerns. Uh, the cost allocation model is very thorough. We just haven't had a chance to get to it yet. So I visited with MnDOT. They were okay with me submitting what I had, and then we're going to work our way backwards uh, towards what we actually think our cost would be. Uh, so, uh, for example, 2020, um, mm -hmm. our costs were over 700,000. Uh, 2021, they were um, around 480. Um, I don't know what to average. We've only received two uh, billings this year. So 
That being said, um, what I'm hoping today is that you approve at least the two resolutions so we could submit those for the application that basically states we will continue to provide transit service in both a dialer ride senior rider format and a fixed route format. And then once I receive the cost allocation plan and work with MnDOT to adequately determine what, our, what we think our costs will be next year, <clears throat> then I'll come back with those numbers in our budget scenario, so. Do we have any questions for Ms. Ellis? I see none, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much. Number five, update on special events. Mr. Murphy. Uh, thank you, Council President. Um, there's two items uh, under this category. First is the Rocket Up North Fest. The second is the proposed concert at the Civic Center. So uh, the Council will indulge me. I'd like to handle them one at a time so we can talk about the Rocket Up North Fest first. Um, so as you recall, at some of our uh, planning meetings and some of our strategy meetings um, and budget discussions some of the things that the council has looked at um, for recouping some of the costs are to potentially charge for uh, costs that are incurred for events um, all different kinds of events um, for barricades um, you know including for like races um, parades uh, police department protection those types of things so based on that um, we have put together some cost estimates for that. So for the Rocket Up North Fest, um, it was, it's anticipated the public works uh, for our manpower and uh, use of equipment, those types of things. We we're estimating 877, excuse me, $1,877. Uh, police Department um, looks like based off of uh, last year's need for police protection, uh, came up with a number of $2,637.80 and Parks Department of $520. Uh, I believe the um, there's also uh, electrical and water usage. Uh, if I remember, I believe that's going to be discussed tomorrow morning at the Water <coughs> um, um, Commission meeting because that is a separate entity there. So I guess with that, I believe Mr. LaRock is here as well. So if the council has any questions of him, um, Otherwise, the, that's what the costs we have um, estimated, and that would be the cost that we would um, expect the event to pay uh, based on our previous discussions and uh, the direction that the council has looked at. So um, I guess with that, I'll turn it back over to the council president if you have any questions for me or I said that, or if the council has any questions for Mr. LaRock, he is here to answer any of those. Maybe I can move out. Justin, do you want to address that at all? And before I uh, no, not question. really. Um, that was, I think, what I was already provided from Megan and that last meeting. I guess that was what uh, what we were discussing. So I just figured you guys maybe had a little more communication. If you had any more questions from me, I know I talked to Mayor Gander a little bit about it. Um, but just kind of if anyone has any questions on what I was requesting or if we could figure out uh, something or if you just, you know, that they're just there, that's, that's fine too. But I just figured that uh, we're going to chat a little bit more. Okay. Mayor? One thing that Justin and I talked about as something we could discuss as a group, this is the kind of event when it's an outdoor event that could either be fairly profitable or it could be really a big economic loss to the organizer given uh, any changes in weather that might come through. And if the whole thing got shut down and, and he's got fixed costs going out, he'd go backwards a big chunk. And um, at least for, for consideration, of course, I as mayor could not make any sort of uh, suggestion or promise that we would do anything until we all got to discuss it as a group. But perhaps there would be a way that we would issue these costs and he would plan to pay those. Um, and if you got rained out one of the nights, they could be reduced by a portion. If you got rained out both of the nights, they could be reduced by an additional portion. Um, so we can, A, the whole community benefits when he brings this to our, to our community. All the restaurants, the theaters, the, the residents of the community, the campground, I mean, it's a really cool thing um, to, to bring that to our downtown. Um, so we get all the, the community benefit and perhaps we could have a little skin in the game. We could recoup our costs if the event goes as scheduled or agree to a slight reduction in those costs if it gets uh, rained out one night or both nights. Just for discussion. Mr. Nervous. Thank you, Mr. Pre President. Just a point of order, the water and light meeting is not Wednesday. It's the 
following. So don't come tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be lonely. <laughs> yeah. So it'd be the twentieth, I believe. <clears throat> so um, yeah, I th I think there's zero. I don't have any problem with a reduction for you know services aren't used. Um, the only thing I was thinking is you know if we were trying to incentivize this. And it might not work for this year because of timing, but wondering if there's a role for, you know, economic development. You talked about the economic impact to subsidize some of this stuff. I don't think it's, I think the right process is for us to put an accurate price on it and charge yet, and then look to economic development to start looking at projects that they feel would. And I don't know what funding is available. I know you have budget, tight budgets, but I'm just wondering if in the future where we want to start thinking about that as these type of events or whatever want to come up if if I don't know how you get the funding or what but at some point like I request a economic development to offset these costs and then it becomes it's it becomes I, I believe that's the right process I don't think it's right for the city to start trying to cut costs or because it becomes a gift I believe that's something <clears throat> I don't think that that would be in the best interest, not for because we don't think of gift as right in this case, but it becomes kind just of an, by process. Just, yeah, it's a process. I, yeah. So I don't know going forward if we could come up with something or <clears throat> at least have a discussion with. I'm sure Mr. Gordy would love that discussion. <laughs> but but like I said, money always becomes an issue, um, and I just think it's an economic development type of issue. Or and I know you access funds from, you know. CBD or whatever yep. um, funds or whatever so you know it would be similar to that but more of a localized thing so that's my two cents Kim. Kim, yeah. Mr. Larson yeah I would just I uh, just have a question on um, or maybe just confirm these are just estimates right and we'll just be um, charging actual cost to the event organizer Yeah, I guess our our plan would be to would have been to to bill afterwards. Yeah, these are uh, estimated costs on on usage. Yes. Okay. And uh, there's and then just confirm that there's no intention to add profit, overhead, things of that nature onto this. This is not a source of revenue for the city. It's uh, purely just reimbursement for services rendered. Yeah. These are based off the cost for the manpower for public works, the what we charge for what our set rate is for rental for barricades, those types of things, and what we what we would pay estimated on time for police work for overtime based on um, current year salaries based on last year's um, estimates. Is that correct, Mr? The number I submitted to Megan is actually based on the people that have signed up to work this event. And then we have, uh, I, I planned for four people each night. I currently have seven people signed up for the eight slots. I, I did an average of, of those other people for the fourth one. This is just their, their wage cost. There is no benefit built in at all. So, you know, in reality, there is, this is a low cost. It's a low figure compared to our actual cost. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Riefel. So, Chief, are they paid whether they have the concert or not? By their contract, they would have to get paid at least a portion of it. Okay. And the fixed cost for well, the... It depends on how, how far in advance. How far it goes. Yeah. But let's say the night before they get rained out. I'd have to look at it the night before. Okay. I'm not sure. Fixed costs for public works are basically what your actual costs are. So there's no real fudge there. Anybody else have any questions? Anything from Justin? I, mean, I don't have a problem if if something does happen, costs get you know diminished <clears throat> or whatever. But could we consider a formula for how the costs could be diminished? Do you want to create one right now? <laughs> 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 well, it would be somewhere between. Wow. So there are two nights. It'd be somewhere between a quarter off per night. So you'd still be on the hook for half, even in a full rain out. Or you could take out half per night of a rain out and reduce the fee to zero. It would be somewhere in between those two, I believe. Either a quarter off per night or half off per night, reducing it by 50% or reducing it to zero, somewhere in that range. And, and to be honest, again, I think I stated at the last meeting, you know, it, 
realistically, the only reason I was sitting here is because we had kind of already been moving along with it. Um, talent had been scheduled. I think tickets were on sale by the time I, I got notification about these charges. So I think had I had them in the back of my mind prior, I probably would have adjusted some things to absorb those, and that's what I certainly will do moving forward. Um, I was just operating under the notion that for the past five years, it's kind of been just an unspoken thing that we just we did. So it was just new at the point that this year, and obviously I was just going to come see if there's anything we could do, but moving forward, if that's what it is, then I need to adjust for that uh, in future years if, if everything goes well. Megan, when was the notification sent out? February 7th <coughs> this year. When did you... St I'm, I'm on the same I terms. Is it before you do anything, you should ask first? Right. Instead of ask for forgiveness after the fact? So I'd like to see the paperwork on the next time we do one of these. I want it in before I hear an announcement coming out on Facebook saying, hey, we're having this concert. Mm -hmm. I know nothing about it. So it... I imagine falls directly time. on falls directly onto you. Yeah, no, that's that's so understandable, know. and that's. Okay. Anybody else have anything? I mean, I don't. Do we need to put in something in writing, an agreement, and have everybody vote on if we're going to waive fees, or what are we going to? What I think that proper, would be. What is the proper and the correct thing that we I have think to do? That'd be city? proper. Yeah, I, I believe it would. It would be better if we had something documented like that. So. Um, if there, if you come to a consensus for what that number would be, I can put it in there and have it ready for next week. Otherwise, um, we could just have it have a fill in the blank for the, for the council what you guys would decide at the meeting. I mean, if it's going to be twenty five percent or fifty percent, I mean, right. no, I understand what you're saying. What is everybody else's thoughts? I guess. I just say actual costs. I mean, if they don't have it one night, if we have to pay half their salary, they already get the discount. Then. You get actual costs. <laughs> 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 Mr. Larson. Yeah. Uh, how does it work with the rain out, with uh, like reimbursing tickets and things of that nature? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm no, just yeah. curious because it kind of relates to this. It is a no refund event. Okay. Um, ticket sales for an outdoor event are not high until the day of. Yeah. Um, I think people just naturally aren't sure whether they're going to take the risk beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> it's kind of a it's just touch and go. But as far as costs go. Um, the bands get paid regardless of whether they play or not. So the second yeah. you sign a contract, you owe them half down, and you're paying them outside of them canceling. So mm -hmm. if, if weather cancels it, if something happens in this town, if something happens that's outside of their control, you pay them no matter what. Like you said, the ticket sales are one portion, but you also lose your vendor or your... Yeah, I mean, that's the... Yeah, you're, you're on... I mean, you're on... You're hoping that you can get enough people there that when they're on site, they're going to spend more money once they're there. Um, at this rate, we're probably averaging, I think if you took all the years combined and averaged it out to a daily total, we're probably somewhere in the 1,800 to 2,000 people a day. So um, we've tried to grow as the years have gone by. We started with a talent budget of $7,000 the first year, and we're up to... I think it's 112 this year. Oh boy. So um, we've tried to grow it as best as we can to continue to attract. Um, and there again, your, your risk just comes on top of that. Mm -hmm. could, I, could I make a comment? Go ahead. Um, I don't know if this would even be feasible, but it kind of ties into the, the next topic that we'll be discussing. <clears throat> Is the Civic Center a, a possible option for a backup plan if it's pouring down rain? And I explored that, I think, in year one. And it was received similarly to some of the responses I've had on this year. Um, that was always a thought that if that could be a backup plan, that would, you know, maybe the week of we put in motion if it really doesn't look good. But there again, too, so that's, not always, that's not always best either because of the fact that uh, three years ago we had a 99% chance of rain all day and uh, it didn't start raining until the very last song that they played so you know it just worked out so it's now you know are you kicking yourself 
um, for pulling the plug too soon on an outdoor and capping yourself on an indoor. But, you know, it's a, it's a catch-22. I, I thought it was always kind of a cool backup plan if it could be accessed. But, um, you know, the reality of trying to make that adjustment and when you're forecasting weather, uh, I don't know how that really would work out either. Yeah. Superstitious portion of this thing. You shouldn't have said that. <laughs> I, I think, like I said, I think we should be as open as possible to whatever options are available. You know, we want this event to go off, right. and go off well. Uh, and I guess I would just like to speak. I know I said on council, I, I'm a person that likes and all those type of things. And probably those as much as anyone, probably more than some. Uh, but to, to Mr. Rock's thing, you know, this is a niche kind of thing and I don't want to speak out of turn but like from my experience <clears throat> talking to people that do these type of one off events like this isn't you know you going around and putting these up all over this isn't you know tours coming around looking for this and trying to put something here this is opportunity you know and it's 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 really trying to catch that 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 spot where you can get talent in that time frame, at that thing. And so, in some of your defense, I and I don't want to try to put words in everyone, but these things are moving things. They, they're complex. They're, and like you said, like you get an option to get talent, you kind of make, you have to make the, the decision now. Obviously, you've done this for years now. Like, so hopefully, like going forward, we have this process at least in mind to try to nail down these dates. But like you said, like if talent isn't available you might have to shift it a week or two to fit whatever you need, you know. So I guess, I mean, like I said, we want to be flexible as much as we can. What we're just trying to do, I think, is make sure that, the, that our bases are covered or whatever. I understand, I guess, is what I'm trying to say, is that it's not always the easiest thing to go and make sure you have 30 days notice before you have a, <coughs> before you try to get right. an event plan because <coughs> You might get on a Wednesday <coughs> this band is available. You sign it down where you don't get. It. Well, yeah, and I, I think if that's segueing to the next one, it's you know it goes back to there is a lot of moving parts when we started rocking up north. No idea what the heck I was doing. It literally was just make a couple phone calls, hope that someone doesn't laugh at me, and then just learn as you go. Um, and it's really evolved every year since then. There's something new that comes up every year, so you just try and jump over that hurdle. But um, there's nothing. I would say, I mean, to my defense, there's nothing that we've done that we haven't had a conversation with somebody that's in power with the city. So to think that the stuff was just sprung, uh, I, I understand where someone or two people might come from with that, but there's nothing that's been done that we haven't channeled it through who we would have been told to channel it through in the first place. Um, so, I mean, back to Tim, I mean, I understand your frustrations, but it wasn't like it was just done and, and whoops, surprise, here we go. There were conversations that were had, so. so yeah, back. I just want to keep building that up till we get to that Garth Brooks right. level or whatever. So. Right. <laughs> Mr. Larson. Yeah, maybe we can uh, kind of wrap this one up. I, right. You know, one, one idea that I would have is uh, if the event is canceled due to rain, that we would waive the police cost. You know, that's about 50% of it. Looks like it's about 5K here. Hopefully we could do those officers would show up to work or they could be diverted elsewhere Seems like it's a it's a way to draw a line in the sand. That's hopefully fair You've got some setup costs that I assume would have already happened before the rain out So that's kind of fixed, right. but the police is the labor uh, that would be my thoughts Sure special enforcement I guess we can speeding for them there Resolution next week to like, sure. leave a blank I guess and Right. So from there, you talk about dollar amounts, but that would hit a little over a quarter of the of the total per night, a little over half of the total. I think that's a nice. Does that that match up with what you're seeing there? Yeah, I mean, I'm just doing rough math here, but it looks like it's 5k if you add up all three of those numbers, give or take, maybe less. Police is a little bit more than half. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I mean. Yep. And that's labor, and they can, in theory, go somewhere else and work. Yep. I don't know. You said don't I think speed that. Good. If it rains, do not speed that. <laughs> <laughs> if, I guess based on that, I'll bring, I'll, I'll just put it with a, a fifty percent cost per night. Sure. Okay. Or no, no, twenty-five per night. 
Okay. Half the total. Because that's this cost is for both nights. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's for both nights. Yeah. So okay. 25 per <laughs> per night, 50 percent total. Use your fingers. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's go on to number two, please, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so after the the last meeting, uh, um, the council meeting, we did uh, we were able to meet with. Um, Mr. Spore, Mr. Locke, right away. I think the next day, if I wasn't, I believe, um, it was actually a good meeting. I think we we came to, a, a, in my opinion, a pretty good understanding. I think so. What we're going to do is um, the 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 beer tasting event. Uh, that's the agreement that we have, and uh, that was before the council. We're going to bring that back. We're going to approve that have before the council for approval as is uh, next week. Um, with the understanding that we would be making an, an, an addendum or an amendment to that um, to that agreement based on what is going to be required for the concert at the Civic Center, more sp specifically the removal of the glass, because that will be our <coughs> the biggest expense on that. So there's a couple things that we, we need. So we need to make an, an amendment to the agreement for um, the concert part of it for those costs that the city would be incurring at that point. And we would also have to... Um, get either a separate liquor license or an amended liquor license for the sale of alcohol at the at that event. So, with that being said, um, um, Reed and I have been working uh, uh, to find out to get an, uh, an accurate estimate of what the cost would be to remove that glass and what would be involved with it. Um, it appears actually our best uh, option is going to be working with um, the Engelstead Arena. They used to have this type of glass uh, in um, in their hockey arena. There, uh, they believe they they still have that equipment. So we are working with them on that. I just got a read uh, uh, email from Reed while we were here uh, discussing this, uh, saying that he spoke to them and said that the that the equipment to remove that glass is available. Uh, however, they still need to discuss internally whether they would let us use it. Um, more specifically, what the cost would be for letting us use it. Uh, he said the process is doable, uh, does pose some challenges. Um, you can break. They said they'd be prepared to probably to experience the breakage of one panel, which we experienced during the season, you know, with just during the games and that. So um, you talk at Ingles at three fiber, correct? No, Ingles said here at uh, Joe. Yeah, 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 the the one here in, in Grand Forks at the at UND. Um, so with that being said, they would be so they would be willing to come over and show us how to utilize that. Um, it does require a forklift. We do have a forklift here with the city. It, they're checking to make sure that it will accept the equipment that they that they have. You know that would that attaches to the forklift. Um, so what we're hearing is that it would take roughly a um, less than an eight, a little less than an eight-hour working day to take it down and then a little less than an hour working day to put it back up with that equipment um, with four people. So with that being said, um, we probably would have two uh, city staff there and then two um, maybe like volunteers from say the Blue Line Club or whatever. Blue Line Club is interested in doing this. Um, we have gotten an initial price from them. However, that was based on um, much higher estimated need for manpower. Um, we were th at that point, we were thinking maybe six to eight people that would be needed from the Blue Line Club. Um, now, if we only need two, that's going to significantly reduce that. So, um, so I guess at that right now, I do not have an estimated, uh, an accurate estimated cost at that. I sh we should have it here before the end of the week. However, so um, if we do get that, and we can. Um, meet with Mr. Spore and Mr. LaRock, uh, if there's a potential that we could have um, the amendment ready to go next week for the council as well. If not, um, the, ne the next meeting after that. But I'm gonna, we're going to work hard to try to have that, the amendment ready to go as well for approval in the, at next week's council meeting. And I think if we don't have it ready by next Tuesday, we probably need to do a special meeting. Though, don't we? Okay. We don't need to wait any longer. So, But let's hopefully... We'll we won't have to worry about that. So, Mr. Okay. Repel. I spoke to my brother. He's got vast experience in this type of glass. Okay. Having run the arenas in Crookston for years, they never took it down for any of their concerts. 
for the main reason is you're dealing with inexperienced people putting up and taking this down now. The Ralph crew <laughs> is experienced at doing it. He said they pinch one little quarter, the whole thing's going to shatter. You can pinch a tiny corner, boom, it's gone. You're replacing it. He said, I see a higher degree of, of breakage than one panel. And he said, if they're talking eight hours to put up and eight hours to put down, double that. Okay. I mean, I guess th that's a good point, and I know Reed isn't here, and I hate speaking for him, but I have had some pretty extensive conversations with him here during this week. Um, and, and we get that, and I guess what I would say is, I, I, I believe Reed is with me on this, is that I think we're, we're willing to give it a try, you know, because uh, um, we anticipate you know, if this goes well, this is something that maybe we'll see more of, and it might be a good thing for many reasons, you know, to have more events there at the Civic Center. So, I mean, I guess if we have a really bad experience with it, you know, we can, we'll learn our lesson and, and we'll either have to not do it in the future or drastically change what we charge or, or something along those lines. But um, I think it's, I think it's worth a shot to, to, to give it a try, see how it goes, um, and if we really have a bad experience, kind of adjust it after that. But it's a, it's a very valid concern, one that we, we talked yeah. about, yeah. Heads up. Mr. Demers. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, it was kind of outlined that the storage is almost at least an equal concern. Like, do we have a plan for storage? Well, right now we don't have a, we don't have a good spot to store it. Um, that's one of the things that, that Reed has been working on with with them as well as uh, is with what we have what they have what's our best option to store that um and like i said at right on on site at the civic center we don't have a real good storage spot but we think we can we can make it work so again that's something that we're going to have to <coughs> kind of learn as we go but did, yeah it's, did they have a racking system that we could borrow or or didn't that's that what kinda? that's what they're well, that's one of the items that they're still that we don't have the full answer on that yet, because when Neil said the, um, a lot of this has been put into long-term storage, and so he's digging through there to see just what they have and what condition it's in, that kind of thing. Good. Mr. Swartz, do you have anything this? Well, uh, the only thing that I have to add is I, you know, I'm learning a lot. I can you tell you that. Give your speaker. Should, the, it should be on. Be on. Do you have it? Okay. It's on. He's a, he's a radio person. Can you guys? <laughs> can, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm learning a lot. So there's just a couple of thoughts I'd like to add. If Jody at the Ralph comes back at five thousand dollars to use the equipment and it's twenty-two thousand dollars to remove it, they will tell you just leave the glass up, right? And then you guys have to figure it out if you want to have events like this forward. Our guys tells us that if you want to have the best sound in that facility, you got to get rid of the glass. So. It is what it is at some level, but then at another level, it's 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 got to be cost effective. You know, back, Justin mentioned some bigger numbers earlier. There's some big numbers involved in this event or events as well, and um, getting this piece done has been our biggest challenge, frankly. So it's the sooner we can get those numbers back, the better we can start to make some decisions. But if it's 48 pieces of glass, and if we go with council person's reappel's mm -hmm. estimate, and we're going to break half of them, well, that doesn't make any sense either. Mm -hmm. So we, we have to kind of, we have to have a cost estimate, I think, before we even decide if we're going to go ahead and move this thing. Well, I, I guess it's, right at this point, we don't know what, we don't know what the cost would be for using the equipment if they're you know what they're going to charge us for rent that we, we so we just haven't gotten the answer back to that yet uh, as far as the labor part of it um, when the initial feedback that we got from the blue line club for manpower on that it, you know when we we're when they were thinking like they might need eight people or whatever the number for, for both days total was two thousand was two thousand dollars well now if we only need two it's going to be significantly less than that so um um, so, it was, so with that being said, you know, I mean, that that was a high-end number, so I think it's going to be a fair amount less than that. It, just the unknown right at this point is what they might be charging us for the use of the equipment. And, the thing when, and, oh, and, he, and my the last text I got from Reed said that they're they're really the what he's getting 
from them is that they should have an answer to us by the end of the week. So I think if, if I may, um, the conversation we had with Dave, it, this is really uncharted territory. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, I knew going into this uh, five years ago when I brought up the prospect of using, using the Civic Center as hasn't been done in 40 years. <laughs> um, the idea of removal, the idea of making alterations, you know, what would need to be done, it, it's unknown because it has not been done. But at the end of the day, we have a perfectly good facility that we're trying to get upgrades on to show the community that it's needed and it's not just a one sport deal. Um, and I don't find it the best idea to try and put obstacles in front that, that can't conceivably be at least overcome once and then to look back on and say, well, can it be done moving forward? Or if it can be done moving forward, how does it need to change? We have estimates on costs. We also have volunteers. I mean, there's ways to cut costs and these obstacles are not obstacles that are new. I've known it all along. It's just a matter of how do we get to the point of execution without what ifing ourselves uh, and saying, well, it's just not even worth it. Um, we know that there's ways it can be done. Now it's just basically how do we how do we make it happen and then look back on it and say, well, uh, is it worth it? I mean, is it something that that is worth continuing to do and not just from from this one event, but you know, are there more? I've thought that I would be willing to do more, try to do more. I'm sure there's other people out there that would look at the facility and say, hey, uh, that's a pretty nice facility sitting there that. I wouldn't mind renting either, but now we have an idea from a city standpoint of well, what's the cost? Well, what should what should we charge for it? You know, what is needed to execute X, Y, and Z event every time? Um, we're never going to know unless we actually do it. So it's I understand the the questions, the concerns, everything else. It's all valid, but at the end of the day, until it's done, we're just going to sit here and hypothesize anyway. So. Go ahead. Thank you. Oh, just wondering, is there, you know, you talked about last meeting, the configuration would be basically the stage was ceremony entrances, correct? Mm -hmm. Is there a configuration possible that you could put it maybe on like the, the player's box side and then take half the glass down? No, this is, I mean, these stage requirements for national acts are pretty, I think the stage Jamie proposed was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 32 feet wide or 28 feet wide, um, which would take up, you know, at least a third of the ice. But if you're trying to maximize it from a spectator standpoint, you want as much room in front of it as you can. Um, I was just thinking, like, you would, this way you would have, you have some floor seats, but then everything would be elevated where if you have a, and I know that's a typical concert configuration, like well, I think you've we got have a long floor gen GA and then you have side whatever. Yeah, until we know if the glass is going to be down or not, we have to leave as much floor space open as possible because if you're going to hear the band in its best version, right. it's going to have to be while well standing on the floor. And from a logistical standpoint of load in and load out, you kind of want that access of right. the ramp coming down in the Zamboni area to act as a natural backstage area. And man security. Right. But I mean, you could use the locker rooms, everything of the players for coming out back. Behind. We hope to store but the glass it. there. What's that? We hope to store the glass there. there you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm just curious of what, if there's a way to take half the glass out and then you could. We basically just kind of went off of what Jamie suggested. You know, he's kind of kind of said default to him on the expertise of that, and that was where he said would be best for for the venue as it sits. I can tell you this: that we are trying to get this thing figured out. But I will also go back to we didn't know there was a concert being held. Us as a council, sure. Okay, just so you know that, but we're trying to get it figured out to make sure that we have an event that is successful successful for both you guys. So, I mean, that's what we're trying to do. Sure. So, anybody else have anything? Okay, hopefully you can get back to him as soon as possible and we'll go from there. If we have to have a special meeting, we'll have to have a special meeting and... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic we'll, so we'll have the answers we need in order to get it on the next council meeting. No, sounds optimistic. good. 
All right, to entertain a motion to adjourn. Moved by Johnson. Second. Second by Larson. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion is carried, means adjourned.